I appreciate the the kind introduction. I, I couldn't agree more with what you said about public markets um, versus uh, private markets. Not a lot of people talk about that. <laughs> public markets are a casino, and you're just trading chips with other people. The house. <laughs> so I thought that was very very well put. Um, uh, so I'm going to actually just put the work that that I do, that we collectively do, uh, want to do, in as broad a context as possible, in the context of rewiring capitalism itself, um, in order to kind of drive not just how we view this market as a long-term opportunity, but the necessity and importance of getting ourselves and, and our, our business peers involved in this in this effort. Um, and then we can get to some of the tactics, perhaps, after about what Arctur is investing in and some of those kinds of things. Um, so look, I, I don't think you need to be like a Che Guevara fan or a Naomi Klein fan of La Revolution to understand that uh, our current economic engine, frankly, is taking us right off the climate cliff. Um, if those out there on this call don't understand yet that climate risk is existential, um, that it threatens to pull down our civic infrastructure, uh, certainly in my kid's lifetime, if not mine, um, then I recommend a, a movie called Age of Consequences where the military security establishment talks about how they view climate risk and how climate risk, the physical events, feed into uh, social instability. Um, you know, I'll give a quick example just for fun, although it's not really fun, is it? Um, longest drought in living memory was in the Mideast uh, not many years ago, and that drove farmers off the land in Syria. Uh, into the cities, the price of food spiked, uh, civil unrest, civil war, uh, massive crackdown by the Syrian regime. Refugees flooded to Europe. Uh, out of the goodness of her heart, Angela Merkel took in a, a million refugees, uh, all from water stressed countries. And that caused a resurgence of the neo-Nazis in Germany. So you have a link between the rise of the far right in Germany with a climate event. And that's what the military security establishment talks about when they speak of climate risk as a threat multiplier, it pulls and stretches our social fabric. And where that fabric is weak, it will tear. Uh, and where it's not weak, it will become weak. And so it's, it's existential. Uh, you can't measure the economic consequences of this. This is whether or not we had the Mad Max or we don't. That's what it's big, frankly. So you don't have to be a Che Guevara fan to understand that this economic engine yeah, is gonna do us a lot of harm. I don't think you need to be sort of a Wall Street Titan though to understand that within that same economic engine, market forces, harnessing human greed, capital, big corporations, innovation, pension funds uh, are the most powerful tool, the World Trade Organization are the most powerful tools we have to solve this problem. So you have a paradox, which is the economic engine we have today is gonna take us on the climate cliff, yet the tools we need, the most powerful tools we have to solve that wicked problem are inside that engine. And that paradox is kind of why I wrote this book. I mean, it's up there <laughs> and there's a lot of details as to how we do that. But what I mean by climate capitalism is a rewiring of our economy inside of five to 10 years, fundamental rewiring in order to capture the tools that we have and harness them to solve this problem, uh, rather than letting the market simply run free right off a climate cliff, which is what they will do if we leave the markets alone, frankly. Um, so it's about leveraging the forces that the left is so leery of, right? The WTO and all kinds of stuff. I mean, there's the right to be leery of those forces, but those forces are powerful for a reason. And so harness them rather than throw them out is my, is my, main, my main point. If I was speaking to a, a group of NGOs, I would bang that drum for a while. <laughs> but I'm speaking to a business group. And look, right now, we as business people, leaders, followers, whatever, have a wide degree of freedom in terms of how we can react to climate risk. We can choose how we become a partner in these solutions. Um, we can choose how to deploy our capital. We can choose what kinds of technology we want to develop. That will change. When people get scared, and they will, when bread spikes to 20 bucks a loaf, and you can bet that's going to happen if we have simultaneous droughts and a few bread baskets, um, people will get scared. And we've seen, I live in Canada, we've seen south of the border what happens when a population gets even modestly scared. I mean, the, the, there's a heart in the air, there, a dagger in the heart of democracy in the US right now because of, I don't know, some minor fears about personal identity or something. I mean, so imagine when real feel populists take advantage of those fears. And right now, frankly, business has a big fat target on its back. Young people, people active in the climate community, people coming up behind us for good reason, believe that the business community has dropped the ball on this issue. They are not wrong about that, right? Three degrees is probably coming. Two degrees is a wartime effort, frankly. One degrees is history. So there's a reason young people are going to get angry and they're going to look for, for, for villains. And right now, the business community broadly is a villain. And when a populist takes advantage of those fears, the rules will change, right? 
the degrees of freedom we have to operate as business leaders will be constrained. It will be, you know, resolution by diktat, for example. Uh, and so it's just not going to be the same rules. So don't pretend that the nice world we live in where we get to do what we like is going to survive. It is not. So get on the right side of history. That's my message to the business community. Um, the, good news, look, the good news is business leaders are stepping up. I mean, carbon equity is not alone. When we started fund two in, at Arcturn four years ago, just before COVID, there were five funds in North America that did what we do. They're 85 globally now. Uh, so capital is pouring in, costs are screaming downwards. You know, EVs, 13% of global sales are EVs. Nobody saw that coming. So there's a lot of good news and we can definitely talk about that. I can be a bull on clean tech. Like I'm gonna make a boatload of money for my investors, frankly. Um, we have some big horses out there. They're succeeding. Like so I'm not, this is, this is great. But what's the point of making billions of dollars if you live in a degraded world? So I can be a bull on clean tech, but a bear on climate. And so again, what is climate capitalism? It is a way of fast tracking what would probably happen anyway, which is a dominance of this distributed, hardware-based, solid state energy system, EV, solar, wind, blah, blah, blah. That's gonna dominate the world anyway, just speed it up. So those are the kinds of interventions in the market that I advocate, there's lots of details in the book and blah, blah, blah. But that's, that's the point of this, right? Bull on clean tech, bear on climate, sounds like a paradox again, but it's not a paradox. It, it, it's kind of the way, the way it is. If I was talking to an American audience, I would probably spend a fair bit of time explaining that Sweden is a capitalist country. <laughs> so you don't have to be scared of market interventions. I differentiate economic radicalism from political radicalism, right? So even though things are looking good on the investment side, look, we like, net zero 2050, <laughs> we've never seen four or 5% reductions in emissions anywhere ever, uh, except in the collapse of the Soviet Union. Right, so, so the, the task before us is absolutely enormous and radical economic interventions are required. That's not the same as a radical political intervention. I wanna differentiate those two things. The right and left disagree about a lot of things, but solving this problem is not a political issue. It is an economic issue because we need to employ our economic toolkit to solve this problem. So, you know, the Roosevelt's New Deal didn't make the US any less capitalist, neither did the Inflation Reduction Act. So Americans just calm down you're still a capitalist country, Sweden's a capitalist country. It reflects local culture, it reflects local values, blah, 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 blah. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on that on this call. I would point out though, because it is important for the right and left to understand, when I'm talking about economic intervention, this has nothing to do with traditional differences between the right and the left, right? It comes from the French Revolution, the revolutionaries sat on the left of the chamber, the, the status quo, the you know, existent power structure sat on the right, and that's how we've defined left and right ever since. We've disagreed about many things legitimate disagreements, right? About moral frame, some view the government as a form of activism to make the world a better place. Some feel like the government should keep things the same. That's the activist conservative dilemma. The world's complicated. Each side, I think, has a point. Again, legitimate disagreements about the role of government in making the world a better place. Unfairness, poverty, education. Those are legitimate arguments. Legitimate arguments in sort of how we view human nature, right? Maybe, uh, people are self-interested, which is how the right views them. Maybe we're fundamentally empathic. I've got a PhD in philosophy. I'll tell you it's somewhere in the middle. Again, legitimate disagreements. There's nothing at stake here in terms of climate. From economic theory perspective, there's been arguments ever since the Second World War about does the government intervene in economic cycles, Keynes versus Hayek and so on. That's an internal argument to the structure of, 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 of economic theory. Climate risk is a meta problem. It sits above all of these theoretical stakes. There is nothing political about intervening in the marketplace to solve this problem. We have a problem with emissions, put a bloody cork in it. Tell me what corks you've got. Tell me how you're gonna put it in. That's it. It's a pragmatic centrist solution to say, I want my most, wick, my, my most wicked problem to be solved by my most powerful tools and left and right I, I have something to offer, right? Market forces, intervention. So again, just to be clear, extreme economic intervention, which is required now, four or 5% a year, we're not doing that by ourselves, is not the same thing as political intervention. The right and left should agree on that. You know, growth is a good example, right? People have been arguing about growth forever. Can the economy grow forever? I think it's a great philosophical chestnut. I have a view on that. You know, ever since the 70s, Club of Rome argued finite world, infinite growth does not compute, therefore impossible. And they got laughed out of the room back then. Because every time there was a shortage of something, Innovation responded to a price signal predicated on that shortage and found an alternative. The green agricultural revolution, for example, all kinds of all kinds of examples of how technology has overcome shortages 
and resolve the growth problem. <laughs> Perfect. So the antibody in the system to solve for eternal growth is when there's a shortage, you have a price signal. The price signal unlocks innovation. The problem is we have to get rid of fossil fuels before we run out. <laughs> so the antibodies in a typical economic argument from a techno optimist don't exist. That sort of price on carbon is supposed to do. Be the antibody. It's like a vaccine in our system. It replaces the normal antibodies that would solve this, this growth problem. Again, I hope we live long enough and we keep our economy going long enough to ask, can we have an infinite economy? Like dematerialize economic activity with energy from the sun, which is effectively infinite, blah, blah, blah. Great problem to solve. We're not gonna solve it because we're gonna get crushed by climate risk long before we have a chance to look at that chestnut. So in the meantime, green growth. I mean, it's about rebuilding our energy systems in time to 10 years. And that kind of growth, everybody can get on board. Technology driven, uh, free cost of energy once you've capitalized it, lots of local trades, you know, blah. There's lots of economic upside to that kind of growth. So stop it with the no growth issue and green growth for 10 years. And then we can have the same argument and talk about it. So look, the general public looks at the business community and they see lots of black hats, right? And there are black hats. Exxon is a bad actor. I think they should be sued to oblivion for misleading the public, not just hiding data misleading the public on climate risk in order to keep selling their product 30 years ago, 40 years ago. Um, Rupert Murdoch has done more to kneecap climate action in the world than anybody else by dumbing down the American public on Fox News. I think he should be sued into oblivion. I, I'm not going to do it, but maybe somebody can. So there's lots of black hats. The public sees those black hats. The public blames those black hats. There, but I would argue for every black hat, there's a white hat, right? My partner, Marie McKaig, CEO of Hydrostore. I mean, these people work their asses off to try to make the world a better place inside the economic system in which we operate. So there's white hats. Every white hat is a black hat. I used to think Elon Musk was a white hat, but I, I don't think he is anymore. Anyway, it's an Elon joke. But most of us, most of the world are what I call gray hats. They're just decent people doing their job, the investment community, the people who are your customers, carbon equity, the people that are my LPs, they're just people doing their job. They have kids to take to work, they have fiduciary obligations, they follow the rules, they, climate risk is real, but they got, they're busy. <laughs> How do you turn all the gray hats white? How do you how do you move capital sitting in all our pension funds to solve this problem? I use pension funds as an example. Well, Mark Carney would say it's just information. If everybody knew about climate risk, if it was fully transparent, then investors would react and solve the problem. I think that's nice, but I think it's utterly insufficient. If everybody knew about climate risk and could measure it and so on, every pension fund manager would play defense, right? They would sell their real estate in Miami and they would buy real estate in Chicago, right? They would sell assets in farmland in the American Southwest and they would buy farmland in Quebec. <laughs> they would protect themselves. That's playing defense. What you want is for capital to go on offense. And the most aggressive offense is private equity and venture capital, frankly, and I'll talk about that later, because we're changing the economic landscape of the options for investors, right? If you lower the cost of solar by inventing a new solar panel, you change fundamentally. I have examples of these in my portfolio. Hydrostore has changed the, the cost and viability of utility scale energy storage. So utilities can be a battery at five gigawatt hours for an entire grid. Now the utilities get to play. There's no limit to wind and solar. So that is a cutting tip of the spear on going on offense. So how do you get capital to go on offense? Well, carbon actually has got one view, I've got another, but this that's the point. How do you put rules into the system? So all the gray hats who aren't going first, who don't want to get on the dance floor before everybody else can contribute to offense, right? And that's where good policy comes in. And frankly, we have need for speed. Like how fast should we, like if your house is on fire, you don't care how efficient the fire hose is, right? So price on carbon is the most efficient way to do this. It's too late for a price on carbon, raise it five bucks a year, if we did that 30 years ago, it'd be fine. If you know, if you had the most efficient fire hose in the world, it's probably a drip irrigation system from Israel. It's not gonna put your fire out. I don't care if the hose is full of leaks, I want boatloads of water to hit my house and put the bloody fire up. That's where we're at now. So when we think about policy interventions in the market, it is about speed. It's about effectiveness versus efficiency, frankly. And it's about political cost and robustness. So when you put legislation in, it doesn't get undone like they did in Ontario, most aggressive climate policy in the world, was, was uh, Minister Murray's 
cap and trade program in Ontario. It got ripped up the first day Ford came into office as red meat for his base because it had political it had political cost to it. So you have to think about these things as policymakers. But ultimately, it's about speed of intervention because our house is starting to burn, and I want a lot of water to pour in the house. And frankly, you know, we, the water sits in our pension funds, the technology sits in. So we know how to solve this problem. We just need to unlo unlock these tools. And by market interventions, I'm talking about accelerating everything. I won't give you too many examples. They're in my book. If you want to give them 150 pages of examples in there, green banks and change building regulations and blah, 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 blah. There's a whole bunch of stuff we can do. Again, to accelerate what would happen anyway. Right? So if I talk to a room full of trade lawyers, I'm like, rewire the WTO. Why isn't the WTO climate high in Europe? You're going to face this issue because you've regulated your steel and cement industries, concrete cement industries, and you're going to get a challenge to WTO and you're gonna to have to defend your borders and you're gonna to have to go into the WTO and fight for this. And I hope as a result of that, the WTO is rewired to be a climate hawk. It is the most powerful institution we have. Every country has given up sovereignty to the WTO. We, so let's use those teeth to solve climate rather than throw it out, which is what the left would have us do. Um, there's, a lot, there's a lot, cost curves of solar are coming down, cost curves of EVs are coming down. We can get into the details now and there's lots of details. But I wanted to kind of position the work that we do at that kind of high level. Again, I, I couldn't emphasize this kind of more. Look, we have maybe a decade or two, right? So my message to the business community is like, you want to get on the right side of history here. So just be on the right side of history for personal or professional reasons. So your kid, your grandkid's going to ask you like, mom, what did you do when the earth got hot? Because they're going to ask you this. Maybe they're asking you this now. Well, have an answer, <laughs> have an answer. Be on the right side of history. This, and self, this is the largest market of the 21st century. We're replacing a $7 trillion a year industry and we're replacing it wholesale. The Americans have just put out the Inflation Reduction Act. When the Americans, they always arrive late, but when they arrive, they tilt the field, right? Second World War. Thanks for showing up, you're a little late. When they arrive, right? That's the Americans. The Inflation Reduction Act, the same thing. They have thrown down the gauntlet and in this new emerging geopolitical environment, which is more about competition between areas, China's an enemy now, like Russia's an evil bear. It is, instead of seeing Kumbaya cop every time, we're now probably gonna compete for clean tech market share. And that's what the Inflation Reduction Act says the United States is gonna do. China's gonna respond, India's gonna respond, Canada's already responded. Um, and so that's a good thing, right? So let's, this is a big market, let's fight for it. And then I'll repeat the last piece, radical economic change is not the same as radical political change. You can be a centrist and you can advocate for massive interventions in the market, because frankly, if you want the world to look tomorrow a little bit like it looks today, you have no choice but to intervene radically in that market. Uh, so I'll, I'll stop there. They're all very high level. I'm, I'm happy to go more tactical now and talk about portfolios and round A's and round B's and seed and so on. Uh, cool. I'll, I'll pause there, yeah. Thank Thanks. you, Tom. Thank you for your impassioned uh, speech for climate capitalism, uh, super inspiring. And I, and I very much agree with your points. A few questions to follow up before we dive into the weeds of, you know, actual investments that you're currently doing and things that you're excited about, like on climate capitalism. Indeed, a couple of thought leaders that you mentioned, such as Naomi Klein, she actually says, the problem is, is capitalism because of our unfeathered focus on growth, growth, growth. This is how we've gotten to such an yeah, imbalanced world and such distraction mm. of our natural resources. What is your response to that argument? Mm. Uh, articulate an alternative. So, so growth is not limited to capitalism. I mean, it's, it, it's kind of a feature of capitalism because it's focused on, but the Soviet Union grew, tried to grow their economy every year. So is Venezuela. So like, so it's not, growth is, is not endemic to capitalism. It's endemic of human desire for more. And look, if you can solve the psychology of humans wanting more, knock your socks off. Culture, I, I'm all for cultural nuance and valuing a song over a car. You know, there's, absolutely. But in the meantime, you know, the, the rest of the world is eating, drinking, driving, going to movies, and th th there's economic activity. And so growth is not a bugbear of capitalism. It is endemic to any economic system in human history. I'm open to alternatives, the zero, the donut thing. So there's people trying to come up with alternatives, and I'm all ears, but we have 10 years to solve this problem. And if you can't get 
a radical intervention in our marketplace done in that time frame, you're not going to have La Revolucion. Like yeah. the, there's the buy-in isn't big enough, right? So it's just more moral. It's holier than now, frankly, and I'm just tired of it. Um, mm -hmm. By all means, contribute to the discussion as to how we change this thing, but throwing out capitalism, what are you going to replace it with? Be like the public is not with you. The Revolucion is not winning the ticket. So okay. from a practical perspective, okay. it's not a winner in a democracy. And from a, from a, from a, from a, from a philosophical perspective, I don't understand. It, it's incoherent until I hear the alternative, frankly. Yeah. And I'm open to hearing the alternative. I'm not, you know, but yeah, we don't have time to wait for the revolution. Yeah, we're heating up. So, yeah. Right. No, I, I totally but she's got the problem. I, like, I respect Naomi's work. I'll, like, when I, if I read her book on climate, yeah. she's got the problem to a T. She's identified the villains to a T. So if what she wanted to do was throw neoconservative American style free market capitalism and kneecap Fox News and kneecap private ownership of media and fund public education and fund public broadcasting like the BBC, I agree with her on everything there. What I don't know how to respond to is the notion of throwing up capitalism. I just find that utterly unhelpful. And just frankly naive, but the rest I like. The rest I agree on. We have a common cause in throwing out free market capitalism, hundred percent. Yeah. No, yeah. I mean I, I strongly <laughs> agree that growth is an and is endemic to the humankind, and that we're very much motivated by uh, by growth, and that that has been the the common denominator across all history. So that's it's incredibly difficult. The question is how do we measure success, right? Mm -hmm. Previously we've only been optimizing for profit and that has led yeah. to sort of single focus outcomes. So one of the discussions yeah. is should we measure success in a in a broader definition? What what are your thoughts? That's a so that's a good nuance. Yeah. So so GDP is a good example, right? We measure we measure GDP just based on the dollar transaction. So if someone gets cancer and it's a very expensive treatment for them, that's good for your GDP. If you spill oil in the, in the ocean, it costs a lot to clean it up, that's good for GDP. So that's, a, that's just the wrong measure um, for one. I think you can start to have a much more nuanced view of what you're measuring when you measure GDP and growth. I also think you can have other kinds of qualitative measurements of human happiness and, and comfort and security and things that we actually value. You can start to measure those as, as outcomes. And the third thing you can do is you can measure natural stocks of things. So instead of measuring how much how many fish you take out of the ocean, measure how many sit there and value the bank account that nature has given us rather than only how much you take out of that bank account. So for sure, uh, there, I think there are, there are much more sophisticated ways to go about the economics of growth and measuring success 100%. And we're probably, me and, me and Naomi Klein are probably coming a lot closer together when, when we advocate for those kinds of things, to be fair. I don't wanna make her a villain. She's not a villain, um, you know. <laughs> One, one other common challenge to uh, sort of climate capitalism is there are impactful solutions, for example, especially in like, say, the biodiversity space that may not have a uh, market viable business model. Mm. How do we deal with those? Two ways. One is you you pass legislation that puts a value on them. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's the obvious way. I mean, the other way is, look, there are enormous enormous amounts of capital that have accrued to family offices over the generations, right? So it, the 1% really do hold most of the wealth. And so, I, and I, not that I believe in the noble billionaire, but I think there's a lot of capital in the hands of those folks that could at least get the ball rolling downhill uh, and demonstrate uh, something about a new technology or a new way of doing things. And I think it's incumbent, you know, it's noblesse oblige. <laughs> I don't wanna to put too much weight on that, but it's a real thing. Uh, especially when you have this much aggregation of wealth, I think there's there's like an argument to make. You kind of have to, and then all. But ultimately, uh, I, it is about you know, regulation and legislation. Uh, relying on no, nobility, I think, is a is a is a mistake. Yeah. yeah, exactly. In that sense, you talk about radical interventions. What are the? I mean, if if you were president of uh, of <laughs> Canada or let's say the United States, what are the top three most yeah. radical? interventions that you would seek to presume? Yeah, the first one, I would, well, I put a price on carbon uh, and I would make it revenue neutral so it couldn't get taken out by the next government, but I would make it a high price and it would increase very rapidly. 
Um, the second thing I would do is something close to the Inflation Reduction Act, where I would I would engage directly with the big capital providers, and I would just give them lots of carrots for getting something done on the low carbon side. And I don't care if they make outside profits; it's too late for efficiency. Just get the job done. So something like the Inflation Reduction Act, and I would also um, uh, set up a green bank. So I do think that there, the, like markets are very subtle. Uh, the challenge is pension funds and so on are trying to invest in a way that looks like the world used to look, right? Giant facilities, you deploy billions of dollars at a time, it's project finance. That's not really what clean tech is. Clean tech is highly distributed. So it's lots of engineering work, it's lots of efficiency. So it's lots of little projects and you can't place billions of dollars on little projects. And, and pension funds, they just don't have the wherewithal to go after that stuff. It's too detailed, it's too granular, it's too small. And so a green bank, uh, I, whose mandate is provided by the public sector. And the, you know you can define the KPIs and all kind of stuff to harness the greed of the money managers and all kind of stuff. But the green bank is out there kind of in front of this stuff, you know, warehousing those projects so you can get, uh, you can build financial derivatives. So, I, you know, so I'd have a green bank, I'd have something like the Inflation Reduction Act and the price on carbon. And I'd go into the WTO and I'd set it on fire uh, with the condition that they, that they cooperate and become a climate hawk so that as I go first, putting a price on carbon as the president of the United States, I don't get hurt by China, uh, who doesn't isn't astringent, for example. So I, I, I gave you four, <laughs> three. Well, I can give you more. <laughs> those, are my, those are my top ones. <laughs> I think I'll be voting for you, Tom. Okay, and um, for example, putting a price on carbon, um, there are huge powers that be, vested interests, you know, obviously in the US, especially tons of sort of political polarization. Mm. How would you talk about climate change, you know, to take people with you? Let's say the 50% mm. of the population is currently still dragging their feet. Yeah, I mean, I, you, you give them something back. Uh, again, this is not the time to be efficient. This is the time to be effective. So I'd say I'm going to put in a carbon price. It's going to be big. It's going to go up, but I'm going to reduce income tax uh, or something. So so it balances up to zero. Do you want lowered income tax? Yeah. So yeah, I'm going to then you want to take the carbon price. They, they come together, and so you just you're so you keep the government revenues at exactly the same place, but you're trading one for the other, and you're trading off something extremely that that's unliked by almost everybody to one that is unliked by a few. <laughs> so something like that, you link it to another tax that you reduce. Like basically in, a, in an economy, you wanna tax the things you don't want and don't tax the things you do want, mm -hmm. right? And so find something you want more of, wealth, growth, money, I don't know, and untax that and then tax the thing you want. So I, I think you can sort of do a, do a trade, a horse trade there. Yeah, okay. the Republicans, <laughs> Republicans are all rich, right? at least at the legislative level, not at the voting level. Uh, the, they're all rich people, senators and Congress people. They vote in their own self-interest. And so give something the rich people want. Cool. <laughs> That's not fair, but it would get the job done probably. Do you have a feel for what carbon price at this point in time would tip the scale towards true? 600. 600. 600. We have, we have five to 10 years. It's six, like, I mean, you can't do that overnight. So that's why it's too late for carbon price. Like by all means do it, it'll, it'll go into all the corners of the economy, but it's too late. Like, like unless you're gonna go to 600 bucks, we're not talking about two degrees, we're talking about three. Uh, so yeah, uh, 600 is the number. <laughs> it was 150 wow. eight years ago when someone asked me, it's about 600 now, I think. Wow. Okay. All right. That would be a, a tough political debate. Uh... Almost impossible. That's why you can't do it that way. That's why you've got to pass legislation that's politically that, that. So no one ever ran an election on building codes. So legislate, you know, heat pumps, legislate yeah. energy efficiency. A few people will be annoyed, but then to subsidize them, you know. So I think you go after stuff that you can short circuit that is less politically contentious and the problem with the carbon price is everybody sees it and everyone votes on it and everyone yells about it. That's why we lost the carbon price in Ontario, frankly. And it's too bad, I don't, I'm not blaming Minister Murray, but there are other ways to short circuit action in the economy that the average voter will never see. So we have to be a little more, you know, Machiavellian about this and not such a purist, you know, it's economically pure to price carbon. And I've argued it's the most effective and you know, so the most, most efficient way to do it. It's an economist's dream, but it's just, you need to do something a little sneakier now. We got to short circuit stuff that ain't going to upset voters. <laughs> I like the pragmatism here. Let's talk about what the private sector can do. What, what do you are, 
let's say the top three most impactful climate solutions, climate technology solutions that will mm. move the needle most on climate change? Energy storage. Uh, there's no question in my mind that energy storage is the single, it's the holy grail of, of clean tech. We've got our own bet. It's HydroStore. They make giant, you know, gigawatt scale projects. They're building two in California and one in Australia. And we just got an investment from the Horizons Fund, uh, which is the internal partners fund at Goldman Sachs alongside CPP, Canada Pension Plan. So these are very big, very sophisticated investors that are behind us now. And so those projects are, are real. I mean, this is not, you know, this is not, no, we're not talking anymore. We're building, they can, they're so big, they can store a nuclear plant all night long. Uh, this sort of advanced compressed air energy storage. Well, and then also, and, and then what's most interesting about that is when you want to scale it up to solve climate, which means you need to scale it up by two orders of magnitude in, in a decade, the supply chain is oil and gas. It's Baker Hughes, it's Kiwit engineering, it's mining uh, equipment to do the, it's an underground cavern with water and air and stuff. So it, the, the supply chains are extremely robust. The workers, the same workers that work in the oil and gas sector, frankly, so the expertise is there, the engineering is there, the supply chain is there. So that's why that's so interesting to me. It's not just solving the energy storage problem, which takes away the limits on renewables, and it allows the utilities to play a role so they're not fighting you anymore. They own the battery, um, but it also can scale in ways that, that batteries never can because you got to build the mines and you got to make the cells. And they, they've got enough work to do with their EVs. So that's why I think high storage is interesting. Um, energy storage, that's the first one. Um, interesting. You touched on a really yeah. interesting point there because it's not just about the technology, but also how viable uh, this technology is and how we can go to market at scale. And, and that's the incredibly important talking point. Yeah. So my favorite kind of topic is how do you invest in technologies that scale to infrastructure, right? Because infrastructure and technology risk are oil and water. They just don't work together. And so with HydroStore, there's a particular way we approach technology risk. The components are well understood. It's a systemic level of innovation. There are other companies we've invested in, Carbon America, which is carbon capture and sequestration, targeted in my mind at cement and steel. I don't care about coal and natural gas can't compete with HydroStore and solar. <laughs> but it's a, it's a thermal mechanical method of grabbing the selectability of the carbon dioxide. Um, using temperature and pressure rather than chemicals, that they're going to have to scale that up. And in that case, we're going to, we're going with a modular approach. So you build a module that is extremely effective and proven. Then you multiply that module rather than building a large plant. So it's it's different in every case, but but that's a really important problem to solve because we aren't going to solve the climate problem with apps. <laughs> so so we, we still, it has to get big muscles. I mean, the energy system has big muscles. It's nice to have solar panels and rooftops. That helps a lot, but that, that's not enough. And so we have to figure out ways to, to approach the infrastructure scale. Uh, I have to approach ways, to, for example, to rewire the biggest arc furnaces on the planet and, and the big cement you know, kilns and so on. That's infrastructure. And so that's hard. And so you have to find financial partners that will play with you as you scale up beyond venture. You have to find engineering, even an insurance groups that will insure it potentially on an operating insurance. So it's, it's complicated. It's hard. hard store spent five years building partnerships that allows them to go to California and bid on a project and be fully bankable. Mm -hmm. That involves engineering, supply chain, finance. I mean, that, that's the unsexy work that you don't see behind the scenes that makes right. them a credible solution. And it's, it's, it's a heavy lift. Yeah. Um, but that's where I think the real action is. Yeah. What are your two other key technologies that you think will have the greatest oh. impact? Oh, efficiency. Uh, efficiency is always the most important piece. So retrofitting our buildings, retrofitting, you know, our, our making our plants and factories more efficient. There's no question about that. Um, and then the other piece is prop. There's still a need for liquid fuels. Um, there are lots of different, we have our own player in that. It's called Woodland Biofuels. They use cellulosic inputs to make hydrogen, renewable natural gas, biomethanol, ethanol. Um, and so I, I think those are really important. Uh, and I, I, I think there's always gonna be a need for some liquid fuel. You're not gonna, you're not gonna electrify everything, um, mm -hmm. including planes and boats and all that kind of stuff. So I think the liquid fuel, you know, next gen biofuels went out of favor many years ago because there's some big expensive blow ups, Cure and Coscata like wiped out billions of dollars of value. Uh, it's coming back and, and, and Woodland is certainly, I think the leading contender to use cellulosic inputs um, and I think their price point is way, way, way below uh, anybody using sort of sucking carbon dioxide out of the air and using energy to, you know, like there's, there's, there's fancy ways to do it, but it doesn't touch 
the cost point of, of a woodwind. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit more about, for example, hydro storage and, and sort of like the, the, the journey they have gone through? What are the key challenges <laughs> they need to overcome to, you know, become a, yeah. a unicorn type success? Yeah, that's probably worth a whole separate call. It's, it's hard to do justice to, to what Kurt and his team have, have gone through to, to get here. It really is hard to overstate how hard it was, frankly. Sylvia, we were investing in this company when there was nobody investing in clean tech. I mean, there was Arc Turn and five other funds. Like, there's nobody out there. We got some help from two guys, Lorem, uh, two, two oil savvy uh, uh, investors from, from Calgary, which came in. But it was a long and lonely road, frankly. Uh, a lot of government support at the early stages. But again, a lot of it, I think, was was our belief, Kurt's belief, our belief that, and we kept doing a gut check, right? Because you keep putting a little more money in. And I mean, Kurt gave up a huge career to do this. Um, I've got half my net worth in that company. And every step of the way, though, we'd ask ourselves, you know, what is the market telling us? Like, are we just drinking Kool-Aid here? What are the signals we're getting from competitive environment? So it was a bet that long term the world would need the storage solution. It would, we didn't know when, but we knew it would happen. And we knew that the cost point we were chasing couldn't be touched by anybody else. And nothing, any gravity based solution, unless the thing you're lifting up is free, can't touch it. Can't touch it. Even the cheapest aggregate in the world, just paying for the aggregate, your cost per kilowatt hour is too low. Oh, sorry, it's too high. Um, and so we had all these gut checks along the way to make sure that we were, you know, when we got there, we would arrive somewhere, you know, paddling across the ocean. Like, are you sure there's land up there? Like, it's been a long time. <laughs> uh, and we'd keep checking the compass, and, you know, there's land, there's land. And sure enough, there was land, but it, it just, it's hard to overstate what, what Kurt and the team went through to get here. Um, uh, so where, is the the detail. Now? Yeah. In, where is the company now in terms of oh, valuation? Uh, well, I, I won't talk about valuation, but it, okay. I mean, it's high, but we have, we have about uh, one, four and a half billion dollars of projects under development, like direct development, like negotiating off takes and all this kind of stuff. So real projects, right? Take, yeah. It takes two or three years to get shovel ready. And we're well through that process on multiple projects worth about four or five billion. And then we've got about a dozen more uh, in the hopper. Um, so there's no doubt in my mind in five years, Hydrostar will be the largest energy storage company on the planet, uh, blowing away anything Tesla's ever done. And it will be a different kind of storage. It will be utility scale in situ, you know, uh, big breathing batteries that underpin large parts of, of, of the utility at a time. Um, yeah. yeah. So yeah, they're 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 well on their on their way to that to that status. Cool. Yeah. What what do you see as like the let's say the most undervalued uh, opportunities in climate technology investing at the moment, and why are they undervalued? Yeah, next gen biofuels, uh, woodland. Uh, so we so woodland we we after Cure blew up uh, and wiped out I don't know three billion dollars shareholder value, we went to see. Like JP Morgan in New York to raise money for our commercial facility. And the answer from their top uh, banker in the chemical space, I, I won't mention his name. Um, uh, he really said, like, I can confirm for you that you've got the best price globally. Like you're, you're the last man standing, Greg, Greg's the CEO. I can't do anything for you because, because of those blowups, the investment community has turned its back on next gen fuels and they're just not interested. So you're going to have to Go to where the fiber is and solve another problem or dot, dot, dot. And so our, our solution was to go into hibernation. And we hibernated for four or five years, kept the lights on, raised money, like literally 100 grand at a time to keep the lights on. Uh, and now the market is coming our way. And we're going to go, we're going to, go to market in Q1 next year to raise $500 million. We've got lots of folks lining up. And it's going to be the phoenix rising from the ashes is the elastic. And I think it got discounted for two reasons. One was... Other competitors blew up. And so people just said, I don't want to know about what you got. I'm not going to look under the hood. That sector is garbage. The other is that it's, there's something unsexy about using cellulosic inputs. You have to find the fiber. You, like there's a, there's a complexity to it that you have to a, a, embrace. And compared to carbon engineering, which pulls CO2 out of the sky and uses wind. And so you have a, effectively infinite fuel with zero GHGs in theory. Whereas, yeah. you know, woodland is not, you know, 8% rather than zero. And you got to go through the problem of fiber supply agreements, which they've done, but it, it just looks unsexy. Um, and so I think there's friction to those deals that I think the price point we can hit will knock that friction out of the way, but yeah. you kind of had to get through 
the, the, the unsexiness of the story on two fronts, right? Yeah. Next gen fuels are old, they failed. And two, you got fiber, that sounds complicated. Uh, and so VCs just didn't want, just didn't want, don't want to talk to you. And so we're, we're being much more strategic about who we speak to. And, uh, and frankly, I will have shadow fluid when I, when I build that plant. <laughs> Unsexy is typically where the, the gold is really hiding in terms of investing. Unsexy is, is good. 100%, 100%. <laughs> Energy efficiency, uh, cellulosic based fuels. These are very unsexy, but for me, extremely interesting uh, areas. Yeah, industrial. Uh, uh, processes, right? Where you're going in, there's a great company. We didn't invest, but like, I really liked it. We almost did, um, mm -hmm. called Via Separations, which essentially is replacing an industrial processes where you, 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 you boil liquid to, to separate it out. Uh, I can't refine it. So refining, what's it? There's a technical word. I can't remember. Anyway, but uh, very energy intensive to boil liquid off and then, and then condense it, right? Um, and they're replacing that with a filter and filters are, are hard. They, how do you prove they work over time and caustic environments and blah, blah, blah. And the projects they're building are 20 million bucks at a time. Who writes checks for 20 million bucks with tech risk? <laughs> Nobody. But the problem they're solving is the entire pulp and paper industry, the entire refining industry, most of chemical industries. And that's a trillion dollar market they'll have to themselves when they get through the very difficult task of showing that technology is robust and bankable. Mm -hmm. Again, very unsexy, a lot of hard work, but when you get there, yeah. you're on your own. Yeah. Um, you have the unique sort of situation of being really one of the veterans of, of clean tech investing. What have been your most important, if not painful lessons in the past 15 years? What are my most painful, if not important? No, I mean, what are what have been your biggest lessons in terms of um, oh. <laughs> like investing, and and perhaps uh, some painful mistakes? Yeah, well, I made a lot of mistakes. Um, first of all, I, I, we were warned at the beginning it takes more time and capital than you think, mm -hmm. uh, and that is absolutely the case. It always takes more capital than you think. It always takes more time than you think. So that's that's the first um, sort of hard lesson. Um, I would say I would say the other we used to think that you would invest, we invested tech first and team second, because like you can build a team around the technology, uh, which is true in theory. Uh, and we got our tech right 10 out of 10 on fund one. Like we, we, we bat a thousand on that. Uh, but it turns out that the team is actually really important. They're just because other investors are not thinking like you're thinking and you need to bring to them in their language uh, an opportunity. And so they definitely come together, team and technology. You gotta get the technology right, especially when you're doing hard stuff. Um, cause you can't pivot if you're woodland, you can't pivot if you're wrong. <laughs> um, but you need it. You, you need that top tier team to go and raise capital. Uh, you can't do it without that team. Yeah. yeah. Cool. And we thought, we thought you could. <laughs> the past couple of months or the past couple the past year, basically macroeconomic environments change quite fundamentally. Well, what are the implications for, what are the short-term and long-term implications for climate companies and their investors? Yeah, I don't think it's changed short term, medium term for climate tech. I mean, uh, PitchBook put out some data the other day that corroborated my intuitions, which is that there's a tech downturn, there's not a clean tech downturn. I mean, we have to be more resilient and we gotta have longer runways, but the, the, the market for what we're doing, we're not building Twitters and rainbows, which are kind of optional things in the world. Uh, we're not building toys, we're building something to solve the biggest existential risk that humanity faces. And I think the grownups in the room have figured that out. Uh, and the grownups in the room are supply, are, have demand for these solutions. So the grownups in the room are, are providing capital and the grownups in the room are providing demand. So if you bring a solution to a corporate leader, you know, all else being equal, you know, you can replace a, a carbon intensive process with a car less intensive process. They will, they have time for you yeah. um, where they didn't five years ago. And, and I don't know if it was a, you know, funny before COVID, it, everything changed in COVID. Like investment poured in, uh, the demand side spun up. And I don't know if it we were humbled because of COVID and we realized nature's in control. I don't know if it was because we spent time at home with our families and we had time to think about what's important to us or whether it was a Swedish girl, right? Or with Greta, who enabled people to have conversations with their parents and grandparents. Yeah. Uh, some combination of all those three, but the world is totally different today than it was three years ago. Yeah. Uh, I tell the Arcturn team, like, it wasn't always like this. It was lonely. Um, you know, and it, it's, but I think that's, I think that's not, a, I don't, I don't think it's temporary. I think it's a permanent state of affairs in climate tech. 
Mm-hmm. Because again, as they, as they say, the grownups have figured out it's a problem and the, and the grownups are going to try to deal with it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mindful of your time, uh, last uh, two questions. How do you see that clean tech or climate tech investing is different in Europe from the US? Oh, really good question. I should uh, I should get our partner in Oslo on, on the call, Kristen. I want to answer that question because she'll have boots up. She has a lot of detail about Europe. Um, I, I say fundamentally, the Europe, Europe is ahead of us, uh, of North America, uh, for a long time. You were ahead of us on carbon reduction. You've taken your obligations under the Paris Treaty more seriously than most of the people. So I think there's been a, a kind of a long-term buy-in on this market for a while in Europe. So I think you're ahead of us. You're now putting in what are pretty complex and slightly onerous sort of regulatory rules around, you know, what, what's what's a st- sustainable fund and so on. Uh, I, I and I, I applaud it, you know. But this is this is part of a, of an industry maturing, is that you're going to have reporting requirements to show your legitimacy. Uh, so I think you're ahead of us on that. Um, so I think Europe's ahead, but you know, uh, don't again, don't underestimate the freewheeling cowboy mentality of the Americans that when they arrive and smell money, uh, get out of the way or join them or something. And that's what the Inflation Reduction Act has done. I hope. Uh, and uh, and that that's going to change the dynamic. But I think Europe's been quietly. I mean, in Canada, we've you know we we've we've given ourselves lots of pats on the back because we're so much better than Trump. Well, Trump's gone now. Uh, so, uh, and uh, and uh, the good guys, the good guys are in. Um, and the good folks are in. Um, but Canada has to step up. I mean, we just watched the United States pass us in the fast lane with that Inflation Reduction Act. And so we're going to have to step up our game too. Yeah. And if we step our, our game, uh, what what is your realistic vision for 2050? Where do we stand? <laughs> well, I, I, there's a highly, highly disparate outcomes. Uh, one of them is really nasty. Uh, and I, and I, you know, I think that's not unlikely. But you know, uh, all hands on deck. I, I think we can. I think we can rein this thing in. I mean, we're not stopping climate change, right? What we're what we're really doing is trying to avoid catastrophic outcomes. And I think by 2050, we'll know whether we did or we didn't. I think we'll know by 2035 whether we're on track or not. So I think those interim targets are really important. I I, I think I think we can stop shy of the point at which the positive feedback loops kick in by themselves. That's our job now. I don't know what temperature it's at. So I actually think temperature targets are not the right way to talk about it. I think the question we should ask is how fast can we go mm-hmm. and let's go that fast. Mm-hmm. And, and there's, no, uh, there's no ceiling to that. Mm-hmm. So we're never there. However fast we're going, we could probably go faster. And we have to keep asking ourselves that question because what we're doing is we're buying lottery tickets effectively. Every ton of carbon that we avoid, and it may sound hopeless, it's the opposite, right? Every ton of carbon we avoid is a decreased probability of catastrophic outcome, every single one. So that makes every single move we make of profound importance. And if we think about it on those terms rather than temperature, then I think we can get there and we think we can probably you know, pull this, pull this, uh, pull this out of control horse back to, I don't know, what's my metaphor or something? <laughs> control this wild animal. <laughs> yeah. Great, cool. I think that's an excellent conclusion. Thank you so much, Tom, uh, for being with us and sharing your insights on uh, climate capitalism and uh, the investments that you're doing through the Arctic Ventures Fund. Thank you all for joining. Please feel free to uh, send any questions that were not addressed during the webinar uh, to us uh, through email at invest at carbonequity.com. And we hope to see you in future sessions. Thank you very much for attending. Thank you.